And we are live. We are live, ladies and gentlemen. How are you tonight? Out there in internet land. Out there in internet land. Is all well? I have to say, ladies and gentlemen, I have been very disappointed in my beloved Amtrak the last few days. They have instituted positive train control, which is some computerized system that's supposed to prevent head-on collisions. And positive train control has not been working. They are positive train control. And so consequently, Amtrak has just canceled virtually all their long distance trains. That makes me sad, ladies and gentlemen. It makes me sad. Trains used to be the all weather means of transportation. But now, with a bunch of ex-airline hacks, hard at work, making it as mediocre as possible, it is becoming less and less reliable. And uh, it's, for all of you who I urge to take trains, I hope that none of you are stranded in somewhere Chicago and west of there, because if you are, you're out of luck. Anyway, enough caterwauling and complaining. It's a joy to be here. It's a joy to be here on a Sunday night. It's lovely to see that, uh, oh, Martha Rowley, I waved at you today, Martha. I think you saw me wave. Martha, Martha is a stealth donor to the liberal snowplowing do-gooders. She drops a check off, not a check off, not a, not a playwright. She drops a check off on my porch quietly. So I just only catch a glimpse of her. Or I hear the light tread on my porch, the light step of Ms. Martha Rowley. And so Martha's here, Terry Hudson's here, Terry Hudson's about to head off on some world traveling adventure, I think on Tuesday, is that correct, Terry? Gary Pierce, Gary Pierce and Martha Rowley and Lori LaRue and a bunch of people were down at the, um, the James McMurtry and Betty Sue show in Amherst, Mass. Uh, and that Betty Sue was delighted to see everybody. She is now tonight in New York City for the final show of this tour with James McMurtry. And then tomorrow she starts driving to Texas, which is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> anyway, I did, I, okay, Martha said, yes, I did see you wave back, Martha. Um, so let's see, and Carol Fulkerson is here. Nat Hunter is here. Uh, Tony Hulick is here. John Wilhelm's here. Everybody's here, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody's here. Um, Yorkie is here, sleeping on the black chair there. Kindly Dr. Charbonneau. Kindly Dr. Charbonneau is out on the town, um, still making his rounds, which I don't approve of. But what can you do? As Betty Sue says, because cats. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we have a few people to thank tonight. We, um, our liberal snowplowing do-gooder beneficiary was uh, World Central Kitchen. Uh, they do wonderful work, and the world needs wonderful work because the world is filled with selfishness, greed, and mediocrity. Anyway, we have to thank my very own brother, my very own brother. I say to my brother, meet me for coffee. Meet me for coffee, brother. He never chooses to meet me for coffee, but he does occasionally make a donation. So liberal snowplowing do-gooders. Thank you, Will Hunter. <coughs> Out there in Fulton, Missouri, birthing lamb after lamb after lamb. I just recently learned, I just recently learned that a Older than a lamb, but younger than a mutton, at least in England, is something called hobbit. I'm watching The Great British Menu, which is pretty interesting. The Great British Menu, where you learn about hobbit. Do you have a lot of hobbit, Carol Fulkerson? Answer me that. Thank you, Carol Fulkerson. 
my artist friend, stalwart contributor to the liberal snowplowers, the great Catherine Fisher, <laughs> the peripatetic, and yes, I mean that in the best way, the peripatetic off to Iceland and Sweden and England and everywhere, off to everywhere. The amazing, the peripatetic, the peripatetic amazement, Miss Terry Hudson. <laughs> At home currently, fortunately not on one of those Amtrak trains, I was just decrying. He often is found on them, but Tonight, at least, I believe he is at home in Omaha, Nebraska. Mr. John Wilhelm. <coughs> right here in Bellows Falls, Vermont. Man who spent more time in Facebook jail than anyone else. Mark Zuckerberg has it out for him, ladies and gentlemen. Probably Elon Musk does, too. But all I know is about Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg's nemesis, the great Rick Gavatsky. The aforementioned, the aforementioned sylph of Saxton's River, the quiet-footed donor, the one, the only, Martha Rowley, <coughs> down there trying out his new foot, trying out his new foot. What else can I say? He Apparently it works pretty well because he was at the James McMurtry and Betty Sue show with his new foot. His pal, foot, foot, Mr. Gary Pierce and his wonderful wife, Elise Cortez. <coughs> our very own, our very own bookseller, our very own bookseller in Bellows Falls, Vermont. Excellent bookstore, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent bookstore. 20 years ago, they took over a moribund bookstore, a bookstore that was mostly used paperbacks. If you needed Danielle Steele, you knew, didn't knew exactly where to go. They took over this moribund bookstore and they turned it into a fantastic independent bookstore in our downtown. You go in there and they can read your mind about what book you might want to read and they point it out to you. Pat and Alan Fowler. Pat Fowler, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pat Fowler. <laughs> and there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Saw a picture on Facebook with him and his sons. There was so much height there, ladies and gentlemen, I had to get an extension to my to my eye to my iPad so I could see I could see high enough. So much height, ladies and gentlemen, so tall up there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, even though the love of his life is a small dog who is so very 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 small. I don't see how they managed to even coexist in the same universe. My very, very tall cousin, Mr. Nat Hunter and his wonderful wife, Elise. <coughs> Thank you all so much. And if I left out somebody's name, if the Facebook gods were being unkind yet again, I apologize. Just send me a note and I'll give you a shout out at a later date. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's reading. Tonight's reading, From My Life and Hard Times by James Thurber, University Days. I passed all the other courses that I took at my university, but I could never pass botany. This was because all botany students had to spend <laughs> had to spend several hours a week in a laboratory looking through a microscope at plant cells, and I could never see through a microscope. I never once saw a cell through a microscope. This used to enrage my instructor. He would wander around the laboratory, pleased with the progress all the students were making in drawing the, the involved and so I am told, interesting structure of flower cells until he came to me. I would just be standing. I would just be standing there. I can't see anything, I would say. 
he would begin patiently enough, explaining how anybody can see through a microscope. But he would always he would always end up in a fury, claiming that I could too see through a microscope, but just pretended that I couldn't. It takes away from the beauty of flowers anyway, I told him. We are not concerned with beauty in this course, he would say. We are concerned solely with what I may call the mechanics of flowers. Well, I'd say, I can't see anything. Try it just once again, he would say. And I would put my eye to the microscope and see nothing at all, except now and again a nebulous, <laughs> a nebulous milky substance, a phenomenon of maladjustment. You are supposed to see a vivid, restless clockwork of sharply defined plant cells. I see what looks like a lot of milk, I would tell him. This, he claimed, was the result of my not having adjusted the microscope correctly. So he would readjust it for, for me, or rather, for himself. And I would look again, and I would see milk. I finally took a deferred pass, as they called it, and waited a year and tried again. You had to pass one of the biological sciences or you couldn't graduate. The professor had come back from vacation, brown as a berry, bright-eyed, eager to explain cell structure again to his classes. Well, he said to me cheerily when we met in the first laboratory hour of the semester, we are going to see cells this time, aren't we? Yes, sir, I said. Students to the right of me and to the left of me and in front of me were seeing cells. What's more, they were quietly drawing pictures of them in their notebooks. Of course, I didn't see anything. We will try it, the professor said to me grimly, with every adjustment, with every adjustment of the microscope known to man. As God is my witness, I will arrange this glass so that you see cells through it or I'll give up teaching. In 22 years of botany, I, he cut off abruptly for he was beginning to quiver all over like Lionel Barrymore. And he genuinely wished to hold on to his temper. His scenes, his scenes with me had taken quite a lot out of him. So we tried it with every adjustment of the microscope known to man. With only one of them did I see anything but blackness or or their familiar lactal opacity. And that time I saw to my pleasure and amazement a variegated constellation of flecks, specks, and dots. These I hastily drew. The instructor, noting my activity, came back from the adjoining desk, a smile on his lips and his eyebrows high in hope. He looked at my... He looked at <laughs> He looked at my cell drawing. What's that? he demanded with a hint of squeal in his voice. That's what I saw, I said. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, he screamed, losing control of his temper instantly and he bent over and squinted into the microscope. His head snapped up. That's your eye, he shouted. You've fixed the lens so it reflects. You've drawn your eye. Another course that I did not like, but somehow managed to pass, was economics. I went to that, cl I went to that class straight from the botany class, which did not help me any in understanding either subject. I used to get them mixed up, but not as mixed up as another student in my economics class who came there direct from a physics laboratory. He was a tackle on the football team named Belenzowitz. At that time, Ohio State University 
had one of the best football teams in the country. And Bolensowitz was one of its outstanding stars. In order to be eligible to play, it was necessary for him to keep up with his studies. A very, a very difficult matter for, well, he was not dumber than an ox. He was not any smarter. <laughs> Most of his professors were lenient and helped him along. None gave him more hints in answering questions or asked him simpler ones than the economics professor, a thin, timid man named Bassam. One day when we were on the subject of transportation and distribution, it came Balencewicz's turn to answer a question. Name a means of transportation, the professor said to him. No light came into the big tackle's eyes. Just any means of transportation, pursued the professor. Balenswitz sat staring at him. That is, said the professor, any medium, agency, or method of going from one place to another. Bolensowitz had the look of a man who was being led into a trap. You may choose. You may choose among steam, horse-drawn, or electrically propelled vehicles, said the instructor. I might suggest the one which we commonly take in making long journeys across land. There was a profound silence in which everybody stirred uneasily, including Blensowitz and Mr. Bassam. Mr. Bassam abruptly broke this silence in an amazing manner. Choo, 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 he said in a low voice and turned instantly scarlet. He glanced appealingly around the room. All of us, of course, shared Mr. Bassam's desire that Blensowitz should stay abreast of the class in economics. For the Illinois game, one of the hardest and most important of the season, was only a week off. Toot, 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 some student with a deep voice moaned, and we all looked encouragingly at Balencewicz. Somebody else gave a fine <laughs> imitation of a locomotive letting off steam. Mr. Bassam himself rounded off the little show. Ding, dong, ding, ding, he said, hopefully. Balencewicz was staring at the floor. Balencewicz was staring at the floor now, trying to think his great brow, his great brow furrowed, his huge hands rubbing together, his face red. How did you come to college this year, Mr. Balencewicz? asked the professor. Chuffa, 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 chuffa. My father sent me, said the football player. What on? asked Belas Bassam. I get an allowance, said the tackle in a low, husky voice, obviously embarrassed. No, no, said Bassam. Name a means of transportation. What did you ride here on? Train, said Belensowitz. Quite right, said the professor. Now, Mr. Nugent, will you tell us if I went through anguish in botany and economics for different reasons, gymnasium was even worse. I don't even like to think about it. They wouldn't let you play games or join in the exercises with your glasses on, and I could not see with mine off. I bumped into professors, horizontal bars, agricultural students, swinging iron rings. Not being able to see, I could take it, but I could not dish it out. Also, in order to pass gymnasium, and you had to pass in order to graduate, you had to learn to swim if you did not know how. I did not like the swimming pool. I did not like swimming. And I did not like the swimming instructor. And after all these years, I still don't. I never swam, but I passed my gym work anyway by having another student give my gymnasium number, number 978, and swim across the pool in my place. 
He was a quiet, amiable, blonde youth, number 473, and he would have seen through a microscope for me if we could have gotten away with it, but we couldn't get away with it. Another thing I didn't like about gymnasium work was that they made you stripped the day you registered. It is impossible for me to be happy when I am stripped and being asked a lot of questions. Still, I did better than a lanky agricultural student who was cross-examined just before I was. They asked each student what college he was in, that is, whether arts, engineering, commerce, or agriculture. What college are you in? The instructor snapped at the youth in front of me. Ohio State University, he said promptly. It was not that agricultural student, but it was another a whole lot like him who decided to take up journalism, possibly on the ground that when farming went to hell, okay, sorry, just checking to see something there. It was not that agricultural student, but it was another a whole lot like him who decided to take up journalism, possibly on the grounds that when farming went to hell, he could fall back on newspaper work. He did not realize, of course, that that would be very much like falling back full length on a kit of carpenter's tools. Haskins did not seem cut out for journalism, being too embarrassed to talk to him. being too embarrassed to talk to anybody and unable to use a typewriter. But the editor of the college paper assigned him to the cow barns, the sheep house, the horse pavilion and the animal husbandry de department generally. This was a genuinely big beat for it took up five times as much ground and got 10 times as great a legislative appropriation as the College of Liberal Arts. The agricultural student did know animals, but nevertheless, his stories were dull and colorlessly written. He took all afternoon on each of them on account of having to hunt for each letter on the typewriter. Once in a while, he had to ask somebody to help him hunt. C and L in particular were hard letters for him to find. His editor finally got pretty much annoyed at the farmer journalist because his pieces were so uninteresting. See here, Haskins, he snapped at him one day. Why is it we never have anything hot from you on the horse pavilion? Here we have 200 head of horses on this campus, more than any other university in the Western Conference except Purdue, and yet you never get any real low down on them. Now shoot over there to the horse barns and you dig up something lively. Haskins shambled out and came back in about an hour. He said he had something. Well, started off snappily, said the editor. Started off with something people will read. Haskins set to work, and in a couple of hours brought a sheet of typewritten paper to the desk. It was a, it was a two, it was a two, it was a 200 word story about a disease that had broken out amongst the horses. Its opening sentence was simple but arresting. It read, who has noticed the sores on the tops of the horses in the animal husbandry building? Ohio State was a land-grant university, and therefore two years of military drill was compulsory. We drilled with old Springfield rifles and studied the tactics of the Civil War, even though the World War was going on at the time. At 11 o'clock each morning, thousands of freshmen and sophomores used to deploy over the campus, moodily creeping up on the old chemistry building. It was good training for the kind of warfare that was waged at Shiloh, but it had no connection with what was going on in Europe. Some people used to think there was, a German, there was German money behind it, but they did not dare say so, or they would have been thrown in jail as German spies. It was a period of muddy thought and marked, I believe, the decline of higher education in the Middle West. As a soldier, I was never any good at all. Most of the cadets were glumly indifferent soldiers, but I was no good at all. Once, General Littlefield, who was commandant of the cadet corps, popped up in front of me, 
during regimental drill and snapped, you are the main trouble with this university. I, th I think he meant that my type was the main trouble with the university, but he may have meant me individually. I was mediocre at drill, certainly, that is, until my senior year. By that time, I had drilled longer than anybody else in the Western Conference, having failed at military at the end of each preceding year, so that I had to do it all over again. I was the only senior still in uniform. The uniform, which, when new, had made me look like an interurban railway conductor, now that it had become faded and too tight, made me look like Burt Williams in his bellboy act. This had definitely a bad effect on my morale. Even so, I had become, by sheer practice, little short of wonderful at squad maneuvers. One day, General Littlefield picked our company out of the whole regiment and tried to get it mixed up by putting it through one move movement after another as fast as we could execute them. Squads right, squads left, Squads on right into line, squads right about, squads left front into line, etc., etc. In about three minutes, 109 men were marching in one direction, and I was marching away from them at an angle of 40 degrees all alone. Company halt, shouted General Littlefield. That man is the only one who has it right. I was made a corporal for my achievement. The next day, General Littlefield summoned me to his office. He was swatting flies when I came in. I was silent and he was silent too for a long time. I don't think he rem remembered me or why he had sent for me, but he did not want to admit it. He swatted some more flies, keeping his eyes on them narrowly before he let go with the swatter. Button up your coat, he snapped. Looking back on it now, I can see that he meant me, though he was looking at a fly. But I just stood there. Another fly came to rest on a paper in front of the general and began rubbing its hind legs together. The general lifted the swatter cautiously. I moved restlessly, and the fly flew away. You startled him, barked General Littlefield, looking at me severely. I said I was sorry. That will not help the situation, said General Littlefield, with cold military logic. I didn't see what I could do except to offer to chase some more flies toward his desk, but I didn't say anything. He stared out the window at the faraway figures of co-eds crossing the campus toward the library. Finally, he told me I could go. So I went. He either didn't know which cadet I was, or else he forgot what he wanted to see me about. It may have been that he wished to apologize for having called me the main trouble with the university, or maybe he had decided to compliment me on my brilliant drilling of the day before, and then at the last minute decided not to. I don't know. I don't think about it much anymore. All right, ladies and gentlemen, all right, that is Thurber Night for tonight. We'll be back next week. We'll be back next week for another chapter of My Life in Hard Times. And we're coming to the end. We'll be coming to the end just about the same time I had down texts, which is the middle of April. So we have a couple more weeks to go. You take good care, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again for watching. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye.